we've been broadcasting live to about 10 to 15,000 people through our own live Facebook page, the Zoom call, Awake TV, and about another half a dozen uh, partner organizations. Uh, and we've done so because we want to provide as many people as we can from all over the world and across a spectrum of professions the opportunity to come together while we all navigate our way through this extraordinary pandemic. We've been in it for four or five months now, and in some ways it's becoming normalized. We've gotten used to social distancing. We're getting used to wearing face masks. Uh, we're getting used to uh, Zoom calls like we're in uh, today. Uh, but there's nothing usual or normal about this pandemic. It's an unprecedented event in human history. It's the first time, as you all know, where virtually everybody in the world has gone through the same experience at the same time. And the result of that is it's put the whole world in the same conversation. And that's really the opportunity that's inherent in this crisis. Can we galvanize a global conversation and a global commitment to build a world beyond the pandemic that is more sustainable and resilient? And this was brought into very sharp relief today by an article in the Guardian uh, newspaper in the UK it was saying that during <clears throat> March and April uh, and early May, the greenhouse gases being emitted uh, were a fraction of normal and actually in the direction the world needs to go. But now that many countries are beginning to come out of the lockdown, CO2 emissions, pollution, ecological degradation is starting to just skyrocket, particularly pollution in cities. And scientists are saying that that is completely the wrong trend and that we have no more than in this article about a year So what we're trying to convene through humanity rising could not be more crucial. How do people of goodwill come together with such efficacy that we can have a real impact on real world discussions and decisions about the human future? Over the last 10 days, we've been delving into all kinds of matters relating to strategy starting yesterday and for the next week we're taking a pause and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the united nations and we're participating in promoting world unity week thousands of organizations starting i believe it was yesterday and continuing through next weekend all over the world are coming together to stress the importance of human unity. If we're all in the same conversation, we should be all in the same heart. And it's an extraordinarily painful, excruciating reality that even though everybody's in the same conversation, what has everyone been obsessed by over the last three weeks? It's the killing by a white police officer of a young black man. And protests and actions sprang up spontaneously all over the world. And yet more black men and women were killed by white police officers. 
And in the last week in the United States, there's been six lynchings. Black men found hung. All the police departments said that was suicide. So we're in World Unity Week. The pandemic is putting extraordinary pressures on the human psyche, on our hearts, on our personalities, on our jobs. The stress, the anxiety, the frustration, the fear could not be higher. And yesterday we took a moment to really go into the importance of heart coherence. It was an amazing session for Roland McCrady and Teresa Collins and Claudia Wells shared with us the scientific research that if you put your attention on your heart in a spirit of gratitude and appreciation for simply being alive, you can begin to harmonize your entire body you begin to harmonize your relationships with other people, and you begin to even harmonize your relationship with the pulsations of the earth itself. It was a power, very powerful session. Today, we want to continue that theme by beginning to explore some of the more, I would say, transpersonal and integral dimensions of what it means to be one. It's easy to say, but it may be the most difficult challenge for us human beings is to simply take in that we are one. How do we do it? What does it mean? We're doing this also on the solstice. And not only is it a solstice, but there's a solar eclipse. So today, from an energetic point of view, could not be more potentiated. So as we enter the next uh, two hours, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, just bear in mind, this is the solstice. And we're undergoing a solar eclipse and the alignment of the planets and the pulsations of the earth energies and the radiations from the sun are all coming together in a energetic quality that activates the soul. Because it's in the soul that we have to rest our attention today. I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, Pierre Luigi Latuada, who's been a, a good friend for many years. Uh, he's a, a psychiatrist, a medical doctor. He's also uh, a shaman. He's the founder of the Integral Transpersonal Institute in Milan, Italy. Uh, he's written a number of, of books. Uh, he's a uh, practitioner of the heart and soul at many, many levels. And he offered on this very auspicious day to uh, put together uh, an extraordinary panel. I think this is the, the largest panel uh, discussions uh, we've uh, assembled so far, uh, drawn from a, a live event that they're convening there in Italy called Feeding the Soul. So Pierre, uh, welcome. And I turn the uh, program over to you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all, friends, uh, good, old good friends and uh, new friends. Yeah, feeling the soul, uh, feeling the soul. In this day, to be able to celebrate, to remember to celebrate, I think that one of the most important uh, think in our in our life is to remember that the life is a ceremony and sometimes we forget we forgot this so we should remember and a moment like this celebration like this is exactly to remember 
that everything is sacred. And uh, feeling on this, uh, speaking on sacredness, I was musing such a lot of uh, conferences in that time, online uh, meeting, uh, and uh, from there I start thinking on all the meeting, uh, all the conferences, all the experience I had in my life. And uh, I was asking to me, what was the most important? What truly helped to change my life, to transform my consciousness, to put myself on path? So for that, I decide to, to create this panel and to get to, uh, to gather the person, some of the person that I like around the world and that I know that they are art oriented, art driven and uh, try to, to share the, the pearl, the gem of our experience instead of uh, PowerPoints or, or uh, teaching, just uh, share the pearl of our experience in that, in our life. So I just, I, I finish with this. I only would like to share my screen if I am able to, yeah, it is. Is it share the screen you feel? You are feeling? Yeah, we see it. Go to full screen, Pierre. Yes, okay. yes. Yes, perfect.
Okay, so we are ready to go with the women's round table. Sarah, please, can go. Yeah. Okay, so good morning and good, uh, good evening everybody to all the attendees we have all around the world. It's a great pleasure, pleasure for me to moderate this uh, female roundtable of humanity rising that is not just an event, but uh, as we heard, is a process of evolution. And uh, we have an incredible female panel. In this day when light and darkness are in the maximum manifestation as solstice represent, I'm very delighted to hear about shift of, of consciousness from lightful women that know even the shadows very well. So I would like to ask to our first speaker, Valentina Latuada, which uh, episode of her life have represented a good, a great shift of consciousness. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sara. Thank you Hello, very much. Hello, Valentina. Thanks. It's an honor for me to be presented by you, introduced by Jim and Pierre, and being here. Thank you to everyone of being here as well, feeding the soul, like we started to do five years ago. Many of you were there, and in between 2015 and 2020. So let's see. I have a few questions before to ask ourselves. First of all, since we are talking about change, when was the last time I've changed? When was the last time I experienced real profound growth, transformation, revolution inside myself? We are asking to the world to change. We are asking to the other per people in the world to change. We're asking the politician to change and to change our habits. And when was my soul last um, shaken by the outer world or the inner world? When, when was the last time I made a big step? into something else rather than myself. We always talk about coming back and to go inside and to be centered and you know to be connected inside. But then I think when was the last time we went outside, we really met the other, the big other and learned from that for whatever we found outside how much we are um, open to this revolution that can happen by the real meeting with the other um, what i experience it's change revolution and transformation every day of my life it was like that since I'm a little girl, and this is uh, really tiring. This is really, um, this is something that um, takes 
a lot of energy and concentration and focus out of my life. I chose a career, my first career as an actress, I chose it because I could experience a lot of different me, a lot of different characters, uh, so that it could make sense all the characters I have inside and experience them and walk in somebody else's shoes. And I hoped in my, in my path to find better ways of being myself while experiencing somebody else's shoes. I wanted to be an actress um, since I am a little girl because I didn't want to be always myself. I wanted to have the freedom to be somebody else also in the life. Like you don't always have to be yourself. You can be better, you know? <laughs> and in these five years of journey of feeding the soul, um, every time there was an event of feeding the soul. So as you said, Sara, and before um, Jim and Pierre, as um, much light, a lot of light brings a lot of shadow. And I've been experiencing panic attacks and feeling really bad before speaking or, be or before uh, initiating any of these events in these five years. I was feeling sick in my mind, in my heart, in my body, every time. First time I was pregnant. The brighter was the light, the deeper was the shadow, every time. Every time before I speak, for this particular event, even if my job is to speak, I always speak, I always teach, it's something that I really do. But in this particular event, every time I'm, I'm starting, I before have to have some crisis that tells me something and that push me to go uh, forward. So what I have to say, it's that my crises are my superpower. My womb, my emotions are my superpower. You know, in our society, hysterical is something that you say not in a good sense, of course, that you want to cure or put in a circle, in a square, better said, because, you know, hysterical, but the hysterical come from hysteros, that is uterus, that is womb. And I think that there, I feel that there resides the, um, my superpower as a woman and the superpower of a new word if we all accept to, to be concave or concave, uh, sorry about the, the accent, instead of being convex, like we've been for centuries now. Because only if, you, if, only if we have concave and not just accept that and forgive that we are, but wanting to be concave, or concave, sorry, <laughs> only by being in, in this form, in this shape, we can um, receive seeds and be um, and create life and change this world. So I really, really hope that every woman in the world and every man of goodwill, quoting Jim, could be um, happy to not just master the emotions, not just um, observe emotions, but like riding them as a superpower because emotions can tell you where you come from, where you go, where to say yes, where to say no. And now in this moment of history, we have to say no to a lot of things that we thought it was normal before. As Jim said, one of that is racism. Matches all the other imps that are far away from being human. No tolerance anymore for these isms inside myself 
ourselves and for the world. And I'm saying you with love. And I'm sending you much love. And I hope that I was understandable and that my message was as well. I did my best. Maybe the next <laughs> the next feed in the soul, I I I would be better. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valentina, for the personal touch and for opening up your heart in this way. So thanks. And um, time, time uh, goes by. So now it's time for the second speaker to, to give voice of, to her heart. So uh, Fariba, no, sorry, Vera Saldagna. Is, uh, is your time. And uh, again, I will ask you which op episode of your life uh, have represented a shift of consciousness. Ok. É... Olá para todos. É, é uma alegria assim, imensa poder estar nessa roda de mulheres. E agradeço muito ao convite do Pelo Eite, para poder participar desse momento. Um momento que é extremamente auspicioso, um dia muito especial, no qual nós celebramos, no Hemisfério Norte, né, essa chegada do verão, é uma reverência realmente grande a essa energia solar. Uma energia solar que, em algumas tradições ela tem uma dimensão do feminino e tem uma dimensão também do masculino. É... E por isso, então, eu vou estar falando para vocês a respeito dessa, desse feminino e dessa transformação da consciência. Não sei se a imagem chegou até vocês. Ok. É, e tal, epa, vamos falando sobre justamente esse momento tão auspicioso que estamos vivendo, onde existe uma um convite muito grande para essa transformação da consciência. E com certeza nesse processo de transformação é essencial essa reconciliação com o feminino. O despertar da consciência, Vera, ele acontece... Oi? Vera, peço licença. Se me dá um, um minutinho para traduzir você, porque temos muitas, muitos atendis internacionais hum? e seria uma pena não traduzir essas palavras que você está dando. Claro, claro. Sara, então eu falo... Um pouquinho, talvez eu vou tentar... Uma, uma, uma frase e depois espera um pouquinho para me traduzir. Nossa, te agradeço muito para a gente poder estar tá partilha, partilhando com todos. Ok, então, uh, Vera, é uh, is very honor to be here to, to share all the message that the Saltis celebration take. And uh, she is gonna start a screen sharing to show us, which is the essence and the consciousness of uh, feminine to to awake. That that's the initial point. E okay, Vera, so. na medida então que esse grande convite, essa força espiritual que está chegando no nosso planeta de uma forma intensa nessa última década, principalmente, é, nós observamos... Espera um pouquinho. É, the last 10 years has a great uh, intensity in spiritual power. So it's very important for us to realize it. Ok? E nesse sentido, é, o processo de transformação da consciência que promove um grande despertar, passa por vários fatores, mas um deles, essencial, é o autoconhecimento. 
Okay. We are passing through a, a transformation of consciousness that first of all is composed by self uh, reconnaissance, self knowing. É um autoconhecimento é, que nos impõe uma reconciliação com o feminino, uma possibilidade que vai possibilitar a conexão genuína com a espiritualidade. Ok. This um, feminine awakening ask us to re-embrace the uh, deep sense of feminine power for everybody, not only for women. E assim, nós poderíamos afirmar que é um autoconhecimento que passa por uma dimensão transpessoal é, que possibilita contemplar não só o corpo físico, que é importante observar o corpo físico, mas a observação também da nossa anatomia sutil, esse despertar de níveis mais sutis da nossa natureza. Ok, so this self-knowing process passes through a spiritual awakening that is not only based on physical body, but it includes even all the other subtle bodies that we have and we live in. E nesse sentido, então, é, nós vamos é, convidá-los a olhar para um, um método dentro da psicologia transpessoal que possibilita levarmos esse convite de autoconhecimento, de transformação, de favorecer essa conexão mais ampla através da abordagem integrativa transpessoal. É uma abordagem que, na verdade, ela passou por... Ok, desculpa, okay. Sara. Não tem problema, Vera. So, we invite you, everybody, to find the transpersonal methods and transpersonal uh, ceremonies, rituals, and all the resources that as transpersonal operators we can find to walk this uh, uh, self-knowing path. E, com certeza, eh, esse método, ele ele talvez tenha nascido, surgido do primeiro instante em que eu tomei contato com a psicologia transpessoal e havia um imenso desejo de levar a espiritualidade para a psicologia. E com certeza, as minhas próprias transformações, né? como a Valentina também colocou, dia a dia nós a gente observa essa transformação, ela, ele foi... É, se compondo, ele foi se construindo, é, até que, há um tempo atrás, ele se consolidou numa forma de possibilitar esse despertar da consciência, tanto na área clínica, através da terapia integrativa transpessoal, quanto também na saúde, nas organizações, é, nos grupos através da abordagem integrativa transpessoal. Ok. So, Vera is saying that the transpersonal approach represents for her the first attempt to melt and to combine spirituality and psychology. And uh, for her, it's very important. It's a very important grade. It has been a long process that's still ongoing, and uh, she's been working with cl clinical integrative transpersonal methods. She's working in healing with individuals and groups, so she's very in this process. E foi assim então que nós desenvolvemos inicialmente a terapia integrativa transpessoal depois a abordagem, é, no qual trouxemos os conceitos que eram essenciais, importantes, para que nós pudéssemos favorecer os processos de ascensão e de transformação da consciência. 
Então, quando nós estamos trabalhando com esse corpo teórico que nós mostramos para vocês aqui, é, são conceitos importantes em processos de crescimento, de transformação, de estarem presentes. O conceito de unidade, a dimensão arquetípica do masculino e do feminino, na, no, no arquétipo do feminino, no conceito de vida, trabalhamos com os vários corpos, com os diferentes estados de consciência. Esses diferentes estados de consciência nos levam a regiões distintas que as nossas cartografias vão evidenciar uma cartografia ampla da consciência. E um conceito... De... Você gostaria de falar? Sim, se você gosta de concluir este conceito, pode, pode ir. Sim. E o conceito de ego, que possibilita um ego saudável, mas flexível, que sob certas circunstâncias, ele possibilita um processo de expansão e diluição circunstancial que nos leva à experiência da unidade. Esses conceitos, eles são articulados, eles são trabalhados através de dois eixos, o eixo evolutivo e o eixo experiencial. Hmm? Ok, so... Um, Vera is saying that uh, during her work, uh, she's developing this integrative clinical work that uh, brought many, many solutions. First of all, in the concept of uh, be present to ourself. And uh, she worked with archetypes, so remembering the feminine and the male archetypes in, the, in this cartography, in this transpersonal cartography and uh, she works uh, even with many state of consciousness uh, to um, to work in with the ego concept and give the possibility to expand the the sense of ego and go ahead toward the transpersonal uh, self and uh, um, having the experience of unity and uh, Uh, now she underlined these two sides of uh, experiential and practical uh, self. O eixo experiencial é aquele que nos conta que todos esses aspectos sutis estão presentes no nosso dia a dia, na nossa relação, primeiro dentro de nós mesmos, a relação com o outro e a relação com o ambiente. Aqui, nós trazemos o que chamamos de elementos do desenvolvimento psicoespiritual, que seria a razão, pensamento e sentimento, que envolve avaliação, que tem uma estrutura mais arquetípica do masculino, né? que analisa, que conceitua, seja por valor ou por ideias, a emoção, a intuição, que é uma característica dessa dimensão arquetípica do feminino, e a sensação, que nos observa, que nos faz observar desde as nossas mudanças corporais, das nossas sensações, das nossas emoções. Quanto mais nós pudermos estar integrado nesses elementos, mais se torna possível uma expansão da consciência. De certa forma, a Ignorância é o que tem causado muito males ao longo do tempo na humanidade. Uma ignorância justamente de quem somos nós. Né? É, o que são as nossas emoções, nossos pensamentos, sentimentos? Sim. Nesse espaço, estamos fragmentados. É, somos levados pela consciência coletiva, somos realmente sequestrados de nós mesmo. Ok, obrigada Vera. The time is is up, but I would like to translate uh, the um, the last piece. So she um, explained for us these four quadrants that represented uh, four dimension of uh, human experience made by rationality that is more connected with male archetypes, intuitions. That, and feelings that are more connected with female mood. 
So uh, she finalized telling that the more integration we can experience with all the four quadrants, the more transpersonal and complete life we can live. And so the invitation is to, is to um, work for know ourselves uh, in, the, in the best way we can. Sara, quanto tempo eu tenho aí? O tempo, infelizmente, acabou. Tá, então... Muito obrigada. Tá, eu quero, então, é, agradecer é, e falar, então, que essas etapas nos possibilitam esse nível de ascensão da consciência e convidá-los, talvez, a conhecer um pouco mais, porque... É uma abordagem na qual nós buscamos articular essa teoria e a praxis da transpessoalidade na mente humana, buscando dar uma consistência àquilo que é mais fluido e uma fluidez àquilo que é mais estático, conceitual. Muito obrigada pela oportunidade. Gratidão, Sara, pela sua tradução. Meu prazer. E então, verá, invite us for ascension, ascension of our consciousness with fluidity. Uh, thank you, Vera. Muito obrigada. And so, now it's time to introduce the third female speaker, that is uh, Miss Fariba Bogzaran. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to... Um, lead into what Vera mentioned, uh, the question that was asked about the personal transformation. I thought about this and um, I could not just put one experience as a transformation because I look at ourselves as an integral human being. So therefore the transformation uh, happens in many different aspects because I, I deeply believe that we are multidimensional being. So therefore, the transformation happens in multidimensional layers um, from, from the body, from the psyche, from, uh, from the emotion, from psychology. It's, it's all part. So I could not compartmentalize even one experience in my life to share. So I looked at what were the most important uh, transformations in my life. And it came into four different for different experiences. Um, one of them, and the most important one for me at this point, and, and it's been always in my life, is the immersive experience with nature. I've uh, always lived close to nature or adjunct to nature or inside wilderness. Like right now, I live right inside of the forest. And I've lived like this for many, many years. And also I'm a long distance swimmer ocean swimmer. So I, I have had these, these immersive experiences of swimming long distance. And you can imagine the encounters that you can have when you are swimming in the deep blue from seeing the most incredible beings like the whales and the dolphins and the fish and the corals. And also to encounter after miles of swimming into the garbage that people just dispose into the ocean. And then you get shocked by that experience. Um, so the immersive experience for me happened also, uh, I'm an, a, a long distance, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a practitioner of Tai Chi. And when you do Tai Chi, sometimes you feel that the energy in your body, it goes through the pores of your skin. And then suddenly you feel this oneness with nature. And that is slowness and the connectedness. And it shows us that uh, we are nature, and I don't really understand sometimes when people talk about nature as if it's outside and we are observing it, but we are it. So, I, uh, uh, so if we uh, destroy it, we destroy ourselves. Um, I, so I don't understand this kind of a disconnection with nature. So that I've had so many numerous experiences being in wilderness um, that was very transformative for me to the point of not being able to live now in the cities. I go and visit cities, but I have to live in nature and, um, and observe it from not only um, the trees and the interconnectedness between the trees, but even the tiniest, like the bee, uh, who wants water and comes around and circles around my head to tell me 
that put some water there for me. Uh, so it, 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 it just observing the consciousness of every being. And the second one that has been very transformative in my life is my art making, it's creativity. Um, and uh, for me, uh, if we get our hands into creativity, and I believe that we all are crea creative, we might not be all artists, but we're all creative beings. Um, I think if we get our hands into creativity, we stop destroying. Uh, I did a, a, a theater piece years ago called a creation versus destruction. It's very hard to make an egg, but it's very easy to crush an egg. So it's destroying is very easy, but creation is very difficult. But then that's the part that uh, to me, the, the major transformation happens when we just immerse ourselves into creation. Um, the third one for me is my uh, experiences with um, dreaming. And this has been my work in my life. Um, but in particular, I've had some major experiences when I was doing my transpersonal research on lucid dreaming. I came uh, uh, in, uh, actually where I live, very close to where I live, for six months, I went on a semi-retreat to experience that myself. And the, the, ex the research was to ask people to ask the big question, what's the nature of reality? Who's God? Who is the divine? what can we ask the biggest from our, our consciousness and, and, and wait and see what consciousness replies, what consciousness reacts. And uh, when I did that six months of uh, retreat, experiencing that myself before I got other people involved, that was life transforming. And I'm not the same person anymore because of those experiences I had. And then when I did the research, People who did the experience, they also had life uh, changing experiences. Uh, so it, it really showed me that even scientific inquiry, the kind of question you ask can be transformative. Um, the fourth one for me, which is, I've been dealing with it since I was 35, is, um, is it, uh, facing the reality of death. And uh, I faced it uh, with my very best friend dying when I was 35, she was 42. And uh, then soon after, a few years after that, all of my mentors and teachers died. My mother died, my father died. I was a witness to the death of the coral of the place where I was swimming in the ocean. And at the same time, the great reef corals died. Um, and then I got uh, misdiagnosed and came close to death. Uh, that experience of facing uh, death uh, was uh, extremely transformative. And I feel like uh, now in this pandemic is forcing us to collectively look at our mortality. And perhaps there might be a collective shift of consciousness where uh, we ask meaningful questions and consider our relationship to nature, each other, and consider setting intention for a big dreaming. Perchance we have a, a global transformation of consciousness. Um, I feel that these four areas, of course, I can talk about, I can go in depth into each of the experiences, but these four areas are not only for me, but it's, it's something collective, our relationship to nature, um, our relationship to our creative life, our relationship to our inner worlds, and our relationship to our mortality, where um, when we are faced with that mortality, we ask the question about our life and how we want to live our life. And, and that, that is, um, uh, to me, is, uh, is a very um, essential uh, aspect in transformation of consciousness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fariba. Thank you for reminding us the great impact of nature inside and outside. Thank you for your words. Thank you. Okay, so move on to the next speaker.
And um, so now it's time for Miss Virginia Gawel, Dr. Virginia Gawel. Virginia, are you here? Virginia, you're muted. Virginia. É, Virginia, o som. Pode, pode desactivar o microfone? Mais, mais alto? Graças, Maria. Não entendemos. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, we have this then. Well, well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I ver I'm very moved today being with, your, with you. And first of all, I want to thank you, all of you for creating this opportunity to meet at this very important moment of our human family. I would like to share with you that I hate myself uh, as a woman, as a person for many years, but I was not reciproc reciprocated because my soul didn't hate me. And she saved me from the hell which is hating yourself. From the outside, no one noticed, but my bad coexistence with, with myself lasted a lot of time, a lot of years. And I choose intimate ties that mistreated me as much as I did. And my self-hate produced a severe fibromyalgia for three decades. Uh, until a deep process was changing the self-hate for self-love, real, true self-love. Now I'm 50 years, 58 years old, but now I'm younger, happier, and healthier than in any other time of my life. Then for more than 30 years, I have been investigating this particular topic with my patients, with other people and in, into myself, how we hate ourselves. And it's, it is a silent pandemic, it's a silent pandemic that has been on, on the planet for centuries and that women, women particularly suffer from. This pandemic is so silent and it is not even called, but its name, self-hate. And her antidote pretend, which would be self-love is so poor that is called self-esteem. It's a horrible word, word. At least in Spanish, you esteem your neighbor or someone you respect but you don't love. It is a, a distant appreciation, but not love. Uh, it's a poor love. Then uh, the self-esteem is not enough for the self-hate. However, this, the entire Western social system is designed to, so that women in particular feel not being enough, enough smart, beautiful, strong, capable, then this is the best nest for the self-hate. The antidote for the self-hatred is self-love and Buddhist Psychology gives us a short word to describe it. Maitri, this is the word, short, sweet. You have to smile to pronounce it, Maitri. This is a kind of an unconditional friendship with yourself. The practice of self-conscious love as when we love 
any other person we care about or an animal we love, one must, must become loved one for oneself. The self-hate lead, leads us to look for someone to help us mistreat us. It's not enough me. I need another one. Generally, in the area of the couple, that is the way to femicide, even if the woman is not killed, it will be like a bonsai, minimized, crowned. My tree is the antidote, antidote to that poison. We are not a bonsai. We have not to be a small tree in a small cup. We have to, to give us on the soil, a big soil to grow up as persons, as, as women. Sometimes also the therapist can exert violence with an excessively distant attitude or putting labels with non-exist pathologies. That pathology left a collective view that the woman that was, does not adapt is hysterical, hysterical. And the therapist ends up helping the, the patient to hate himself even more. And with the name, uh, the name of a non-existence non pathology when it doesn't exist. And also the, the man who rejects his sensitivity, his inner femininity, enters the, sun, the same circuit of self-hatred. The guide for this process of my tree, both in myself and in my work as a therapist, as a teacher, is provided by, by the wisdom of the unconscious itself, because the core of the unconscious is the soul. Uh, if we must learn how, do, how to listen to the guide of our essence and the essence of our patient in the therapy process, we help the other to get out of the self-hatred by practicing maitri, which occurs in every act or election of daily life. Loving yourself, being with, letting yourself be loved by your own unconscious. It's not just to love myself, it's receive love from my own core, which supports our hero journey. Thank you, Regina. Well. Okay. Do, do you want to finalize last sentences? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 for the end, we need emotional education for non-violence toward oneself, toward the environment, non-violence between genders, between races, between countries, must be with no violence towards oneself, whose great escalation is suicide, femicide, homicide, and ecocide. We need to practice maitri and to teach another to do it, women and men. Thank you, thank you very much. Gracias, thank you, Virginia. It's a great message for the future. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you from Argentina. <laughs> okay, so move on to our last female speaker, that is Dr. Marina Belokurova. Marina, are you with us? I'm here. Okay. The stage is yours. Yes. And for the first, I thank you for you giving me the opportunity to discuss this important topic. So pandemic uh, help <laughs> to recall all my crises. And I want uh, to uh, describe some uh, roadmap 
of my history and great episode of my life that changed my perception of the world. And I was able to identify four important events of my life that changed my perception. The first is a meeting that I had with a problem that seemed unsolvable. The second is a commitment that I made to myself. The third is the confidence that I developed as a result of keeping that commitment. And the last experience is a miracle, just a miracle that happened in my life. The first experience was when I was only seven and it was the question, where does space end? And one day I had the distinct feeling that we have always know everything, but we forget everything. And I want to find answer why, why we forget this knowledge. And before 30 years of deep work as psychologist, I worked for 20 as a mathematician. And I think it was a simple and yet unsolvable problem. Where does space end? That sparked my interest in mathematics and psychology. In the age of 23, I had my next experience. And during that time in my life, I had so many challenging experiences and obstacles that my unconsciousness decided to drown me, literally. And one day at sea, I swam alone about a kilometer away from the coast. I used to be a good swimmer, but suddenly I became weak and began to drown. So I called for help and I called to God and made a commitment. God, help me now and I will solve all my problems. And this experience showed me that when the problem seems unsolvable and the ego has given up, the usual tools just don't work. So by making a commitment to yourself, it can help you to cope. At the age of 28, I went through a deep personal existential crisis. I understood that I was living someone else's life. So I went to yoga, vegetarian food, and so on, but nothing helped. However, I did ultimately find help. So at the first seminar in Russia of Robert Dubiel, where we did breathwork, otherwise known as rebirthing. And after the seminar, I asked Robert, why do I feel so bad? Why is everything going wrong in my life? And he told me, that it was the call of death. At that moment, I didn't know that call of death means that your mind has become consumed by the thought, everything is meaningless. Nothing can be changed. So why live on? After a time, I realized that the call of death changes you. The rebuilding session changed my perception and inspired me to study a lot of different beautiful things, but I still had not fully decided to change my life. It, and, uh, after a year and a half of doubts, what I would now call a shamanic illness happened to me. Within two weeks, only two weeks, uh, I was given three terrible diagnoses. I was robbed three times. <laughs> and it was involved in a car accident, it became very clear that I should say, stop. I went to my yoga teacher and asked, what is it? And she told me, this is a test before the turn. Where should I turn? I asked in this desperation, where should I turn? I went home because she just kept silent, smiling and stroking me. And I went home and said to myself, where was it really right and good for you? And answer came to me where you left from. And I came back to transpersonal psychology and I didn't doubt it. This insight was critical to my understanding of the world. It is the point that you need to understand and ask what exactly you're missing. Get it in an amazing way and move further. I remember how this gift came to me, belief in unconditional love, that you don't need to be perfect 
just sincere because someone out there loves you very much that you have the right to do exactly what is interesting what gives you drive that you can live where you want with whoever you want and do exactly what you want that the fullness of being can be experienced even after most difficult days and then you finally realize that you are exactly in your place and do exactly what is inherent in your nature the last experience i want to share with you that have transformed my perception of the world are miracles. But they are still miracles. And these are the most incomprehensible things that had happened in my life. The first is a near death experience that I had. I came back with the message that we are definitely bigger than our bodies. The message came out of nowhere, but it was the message that brought me back from the tunnel. The second miracle I have experienced in the Dzogchen practice of release from addictions. And through my practice, I now know for sure that what is much bigger than we imagine, I know that after our lives, we continue being, we can exist further. And lastly, recently on my favorite Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage route to the shrine of San James in Spain, which we have been walking for 11 years. I fell into a snow crevice while hiking all the way past in mountains. But the most amazing thing and how my body reacted and how I jumped out of there. I now know for sure that what made it real is what I feel my true nature that it is pure happiness and the deepest involvement in the experience of the living world around you. It is a sense of bodily inclusion in a single living world. And I think it is this perception, this is the most important thing to understand at this time during this current world crisis, pandemic, because it is what makes us alive. Thank you. I love you. Thank you very much, Thank Marina, for the you. intensity and the deepness of your words. Thanks. Thank and thanks to our beautiful female speakers for their open heart full of love. So the female roundtable is, is done. I think, unfortunately, we don't have any extra time for uh, questions, uh, even though it would be have been very interesting. And I pass to my colleague Francesco for the second panel of men. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Hello, everybody. My name is Francesco and I'm a uh, biotransenergetic and uh, transpersonal counselor from Italy. And I will be the moderator for the round table of uh, male wisdom on the same topic as before. So I invite the, the speakers to uh, kindly switch on the cam and the microphone. And I remind that we have, uh, we have four speakers and uh, uh, every speaker has uh, about eight minutes. And at the end of the eight minutes, I will uh, ring the Tibetan ball. And so uh, you can bring the, the, the speech to a conclusion. So the, the first person we have is uh, uh, PhD Stuart uh, Sovaski. He, uh, he was the first to bring meditation into a youth prison. He, he directed a Kundalini clinic for 40 years. He wrote four books on Kundalini Tantra. He, he was the creator of uh, the 2008 India Conference. So, uh, so Mr. Sovaski, what was, uh, they, I posed you the same question as uh, before. So what was necessary for you in your personal experience to achieve a shift of consciousness? We're talking in about six minutes. Okay. Uh, so. 90% of that for you because I know you love it. Lina, come on, I'm just going to go up to water and clean up. Okay, Lina. Please, uh, uh, yes. uh, 
Unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah I'll talk in five minutes. Okay. 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 Dark? Oh. okay. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> please, uh, the others who are not speaking, please switch off the, the microphone. So now we can move to Dr. Sovatsky. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, at the, the, the last um, feeding of the soul in, at Mandali uh, uh, really kind of, in a sense, changed my, my life. I thought I was retired. And so uh, after like a 50 year uh, career, and uh, I realized I wasn't retired. Um, and, and with this question of inspiring experiences, um, that I can track through a 50 year uh, career. I noticed that I was always attracted to very dire situations as a clinician or <clears throat> suicidal people, um, people in prison. Uh, as as uh, Francesco noted, I, I had a chance back in the early 70s to introduce yoga and meditation to prison environments for the first time. Uh, but nobody knew what it really even what the word meant. Um, and then homicidal situations. I worked in police departments, um, and I tracked it back. And I, it, it, it it was a time in this late '60s on uh, my during my time in college. I was studying religion at Princeton, and like many people in, in the transpersonal movement at that time, uh, I was on an LSD trip on my college campus. And it was a very magical, obviously this very magical feeling that I believe anyone on a psychedelic will know. I don't have to say too much about it, except that was the time when the Vietnam War was happening. And I could only feel the horrors of what was happening in Southeast Asia and I was wandering around, I was weeping, and I ended up get, encountering the police. I was like 20 years old, this is 1969 or 70. And I didn't, and he asked me my name. And it was a, a, in a Buddhist meditative state, you wanna be know your name in case the police uh, uh, ask you. And I didn't know my name exactly. So he, he, they took me and put me in a cell in the Princeton Municipal Jail cell to let me uh, calm down, I suppose. And, it, and uh, it was a very challenging situation, but now I can see how critical that four or five hours in that jail cell well, was for the whole rest of my life in being drawn to helping people in the worst situations imaginable. Uh, lobotomy, psychiatric patients, um, people in mental hospitals their whole life, homeless. All, all, it was just endlessly believing that we sh I should be with where there's the most suffering. So I'm tracking it back now to being in this cell and I'm remembering the guy in the next cell started talking to me, he was a black man, interesting uh, for current times. And he asked me, you know, what am I doing in, you know, in the cell? And I said, you won't believe it, but I'm peeking on LSD and I'm a student at the university. And he, he couldn't believe that a Princeton student would be in a prison cell next to him. And I said, I was, he said, what are you studying? I said, ethics. That's only 50 years ago. I remember the sound of his voice perfectly well. And I think that initiated the next 50 years, certainly the next 10 years of working in prisons and so on, that that was a horrible situation to be peaking in, on LSD. So you want the opposite. You want to be supported. You don't want to be, uh, uh, it, it, you know, but it was good for me because I could, I felt, I got completely immersed in the, in the lowest level of our culture. So yeah, I, I, I became a juvenile probation officer. I had a I discovered yoga and meditation just simultaneously at that same, in the early 70s, started teaching it wherever I could. It was one of the first things I came across that really helped. Uh, I took inordinate types of, of yogic vows that I won't get into that completely changed my sense of gender. I, uh, like, like the word yoga can't be translated. 
we kind of know what it means, but other words, they're harder to know what they mean, like Kundalini, we have some rough idea. But uh, Ardhanari is the term for the gender that comes up in yourself after decades of this kinds of yoga practice. So uh, uh, it's in be it's a commingled gender. You're, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's not even a noun. It's not even a pronoun. It's a state of, of a kind of eros. And it just not, doesn't end. It never ends. And so I see, yeah, well, you, you see on the outer world, the male, female uh, falling in love. But this is, some, it's internal. Just, this doesn't stop. And I believe that that's what sustained me in working in these horrific environments for the whole of my career. I presented uh, a year ago on this homicidal situation I was involved in, which was incredibly difficult, where someone was threatening to kill and I decided to intervene and take responsibility so he wouldn't go to jail. If you were with me then, I can tell you, it was about now two months ago that, that uh, uh, the guy that I kept out of jail contacted me and thanked me for saving his life. Because he was there, was the people around him wanted to go to jail. He's threatening to shoot people. I said, "Nah, I'll talk to him." And his life, he didn't go to jail. And I know what happens to people in jail, not just myself, but uh, working in them for so long. And so uh, it's like this karmic return of of this peak moment in, the, in a very difficult situation, and then work life that unfolded transpersonal. I didn't have. Uh, uh, the clients I had, they, they, they were the Black Lives Matter people. They, they, they you know, this was way back. And uh, I remember, yeah, finding out about meditation and thinking, oh, I had something to offer. And uh, I started teaching it wherever I could in, uh, in, in that city, it was Atlantic City, New Jersey. And I wrote a grant. I, uh, Francesco noted that, yeah, that I brought meditation into prisons. And this is a very interesting story. I wrote a grant on meditation in prisons and trying to get, I think, like it would have been $75,000 to, to uh, teach uh, meditation in schools and prison. Nobody had ever done this before. So the grant examiner came to, to tell me that they were rejecting my grant. And I knew he had no experience of what meditation was. So I taught it to him. And when he opened his eyes, he said, I'll get you the money. And I now think about telling people that story, it, wherever you are in your career, you never know when, if you take a certain kind of a risk, that it will turn out to be a historical uh, uh, change or contribution to your field because now yoga and meditation, it's in everywhere. It's all, it's all kinds of prisons and all kinds of other environments. But this was the very first time that uh, it was like a generation divide and it worked. And so it, it got me confident to keep trying what I believed in. And um, yeah, so I, I'm not gonna get too much into like different case studies, but um, from another angle, it, it turned out to be the subtlest moments the most poignant, subtle moments. It wasn't dramatic breakthroughs that were so only spiritual of Kundalini awakening or something like that. Like I had a father and son in my office uh, uh, as a probation officer and the son was gonna go to jail. And uh, the father gave him a cigarette before getting sentenced. And for some reason I told him, I said, Erwin, can you thank your dad for the cigarette? And he said, thanks dad. And they both started weeping. And I said, this is the father and son loyalty that you should never forget when you're in prison. Your father, and I was making it up on the spot. Not, not all fathers will come to court with their son, particularly going to jail. And your father is here. And when he thanked his father for the cigarette, for lighting a cigarette, they both started crying. So it's very subtle. It's very, you know, we think dramatic, you know, stop crime and all this. This was just seeing a moment uh, in which uh, it was, you know, it was horrifically sad. And so I hope that I was able to convey some of that 
uh, poignancy of that experience. Another memory of thousands of memories that came to me while I was writing uh, a bit of this outline for my eight minutes is uh, for 20 years, I was a trustee for the California Institute of Integral Studies, if you know, it's one of the main transpersonal uh, universities, I, I think, in the, in the world. So I was on the board for uh, 20 years. I, most of the time, I would sit next to the chairman, who was a woman, Elizabeth McCormick. And she was also the chair of the MacArthur Foundation, which gives away the, the, these $500,000 awards, genius awards around the world. And she was the head of the MacArthur Foundation. And she was the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, Lawrence Rockefeller. These are very powerful wealthy philanthropical situations. So I would sit with her, I got to know her pretty well. She was 30 years older than me, I would start thinking. She must, she was probably in her eighties when I was in my fifties. And, and I would sit next to her, next to her. And, one, and I knew her husband had died. It was maybe 15 years into knowing her. And she came anyway to the board meeting and she was moving her wedding ring around her finger. And uh, I could only uh, talk about emotion. We were, the, the women's group was talking about emotionality. I could feel a 50 year marriage or however long, I think it was 65 years of marriage. It was an incredibly long marriage that she had had. And her moving this ring is so vivid in my mind right now that that was her loss. And she was staying in touch with her husband during this uh, board meeting by doing this over and over again. I'll never forget it. And I'm just trying to convey, I have thousands, we all have thousands of very subtle moments in time where something very poignant is happening. And it cuts you, it goes right, I can sort of try to point here, it goes right in. And if we start seeing those, I found out those are like very powerful leverage moments to change people's lives if we notice them and put them into words. Am I about finished? Uh, yes. Well, please. I have, uh, is that it? Can, or yes. I can close it. Yeah, let me just tell you one other tiny one. I had, this is a, one of the worst domestic violence situations I, that I had. The guy was in jail. He just got out of jail. The husband and wife, I saw them. It was not easy. It's a lot of violent emotionality. It was very hard. That's, it was one of the hardest I've ever encountered. And I didn't think I was getting anywhere. I saw the couple 70 hours in three months because it was very intensive because it was domestic violence and stuff like that. And I wasn't getting anywhere. It'd be very up and down, up and down. One, the last session, he, the, the husband said, I need to talk to you. And so the wife left the room and he said, last night I was driving home and I hit a deer with my car. And now I know what you were trying to tell me about me is I destroy living things in my family. And I just said, never let go of that memory. And that, that deer gave you his, her life so that you would know, yeah, this is not in a vacuum what's, what, the way you're behaving. So that is my, it was my last <coughs> clinical session. And to just share, you never know where, where something from God, where these miracles come that change people's lives. So thank you. Thank you very much for your precious uh, sharing of experience. You're welcome. And we can now move to the second speaker of the uh, male round table is uh, Dr. Serge beddington Barons. He's an Oxford-educated transpersonal psychotherapist. He's a shaman, he's an, an activist, and he's a spiritual educator as well. So uh, please share with us uh, any kind of experience, uh, process, episode, which you enhanced your uh, consciousness. Thank okay. You. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just got a, yeah, okay, fine. Hi. Um, I just want to say that consciousness loves contrast. And we've just heard such a moving talk from my dear loving friend, Stuart. And we heard the depth of his soul and his sweet, sweet heart. So I've decided against 
telling stories. And I prepared two things, either telling stories or saying 15 things that were really important in my spiritual journey. So, so my friends, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to just say 15 things very quickly. And if there's time, I'll sing a blues song called Coronavirus Blues, but if there isn't, um, and it's going to tell the story. Okay, first thing, shock. This virus has changed me. I felt anger about the world. Now I feel indignation and my desire to be of service, to make a difference, has quadrupled in me. So I've been shocked to the core. It was Gurdjieff who said, we only change if we're hit by a shock greater than the sum of our own inertia. So shock is very important. If it doesn't kill us, it transforms us. Second thing is grace. I've had grace in my life. I haven't asked for it, but it's come and sought me out. And it's moved me to the right people, the right experiences and teachings. It's moved me to be a friend of, of dear Stuart and Per Luigi. I call that grace. They're wonderful people. They've done so much for my life. My third thing that is important is a desire to change, a desire to wake up, a desire of being fed up with one's normalcy a desire of wanting to involve a kind of divine discontent with oneself and with the world. So that has been really important, the desire, because if we have a desire, then we have an intentionality. And this intentionality to awaken consciousness is so important then we're a space to attract the helping forces, the loving forces that are very close to us at this particular time in our evolution. And um, I talk about this, I've just written a new book called um, Gateways to the Soul, and I talk about all this in my new book. Um, also important is choosing to focus on transpersonal qualities, on love, celebration, and joy, because they awaken us. And the old story of humanity is such a loveless, materialistic one, that to change the scenario is, is so important. Another important thing is encounters. I've encountered people who showed me new ways to be. And when I was very young, I went to Findhorn Community. I was 20 years old, it was a little caravan. That encounter changed my life. I suddenly met people who were real and genuine and it set the context for the rest of my life. P spiritual practices, very important. We cannot awaken or most of us cannot, if we don't do a form of prayer and meditation. And those are very central to my life. I actually try to make my life a prayer and a meditation and to see it as a sacred practice. So, you know, today, this morning, I went down to the beach. I've been swimming all day. And and that was my sacred practice, and it was great. I had a wonderful time. I felt close to the sea. I felt close to the divine. I felt close to all the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. So important. And to do things that make our hearts dance, that awaken our soul. And, of course, being of service, I was described as an activist. I see myself as a spiritual activist. I try, my last book was about spiritual activism. I think if we take a stand for a new spiritual way of being, it kind of creates a field around us that that flows out from us. And it has done wonders for my ego that is always longing to come back and looking for any excuse to come back and push my good intentions out of the way. And if we can try to be of service as, as 
as my dear friend Stuart, you know, talked about in his very noble way of being of service to the most impoverished of people is tremendously important. I would also like to put psychedelic experiences. They don't, um, they confirmed what my readings have done and I'm, I'm sort of mainly talking about ayahuasca, very important in a particular um, stage of my life. Um, it kind of showed me a little bit more about how God works. And by the way, a wonderful book. If you haven't read this book by, by Christopher Bash, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Diamond from Heaven, one of the most profound books I've read about his journey um, into the heart of God. Very, very, very important. Okay, transpersonal psychology. I'm a transpersonal psychologist, so I've had to you know, work with my subpersonalities, my shadow, very, very important. I, very, very, you know, I put that very high. I've also sat at the feet of, of spiritual masters, and that's been important. Um, I've never been a kind of guru follower, but I've sat with different teachers and I've learned from them. And I think that it's so important to sit with people who are more awakened than ourselves, because just as we can catch a cold, that we can catch their awakening. Um, also, I think it's important, I've done a lot of work with my dark side and my evil. I call my evil because I think that we all have an evil and dark side. It was Thich Nhat Hanh who said that we all have a murderer and a rapist and a shootist inside us. And I think that's very important that we understand our own sort of capacity. And I see that so, so many of my projections against Donald Trump is that he has embodied certain aspects that I have or that I have had and I'm, I'm slowly trying to eliminate themselves in me. Um, okay, I also put down hard work and discipline. We've got to do the inner work if we want to change. We've got to explore our psyches. We've got to do the spiritual ascending the mountain work. We've got to do the shadow work going down to our depths. And we've got to have a discipline, you know, and so that it's not just something that we do occasionally um, if we're going through problems. So to do, um, to have discipline and, and to do the inner work is very, very important. And to see um, our daily life as a sacred practice, that is what I try to do in all the small things so that I can try to bring a sacred space into that. The, the last important thing I want to say, and I've emphasized this in my new book, I've got two chapters on friendliness and friendship. We need to be more friendly to the world. We need to put efforts into building up friendships, spiritual friendships, soul friendships, ordinary friendships, and to be very friendly to people. If we're friendly to people, racism does not exist. My way of dealing with the racist tendencies that I inherited, because sure, I, you know, I, I inherited a story about humanity that was sexist and racist and, um, and misogynist and patriarchal and homophobic. And I was all those things. And I found that tuning into the heart of friendship has been so, 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 so important for me. Um, I'm gonna, um, I tell you, I broke off this finger so I can't play the guitar and I've just taken up the ukulele and I have no voice, but I'm gonna sing you just um, to end uh, to make you laugh. Is that okay? I, I'm sorry, but I think uh, we are running out of time. Okay. If we, 
we have time at the end. I, I will, um, uh, just, I will give um, some time for the song. Just 20 seconds. Just 20 oh, seconds. Okay. Oh, good morning, Corona flowers. Well, how do you do? Good morning, virus. Well, how do you do? You stay away from me, and I'll stay away from you. I hear that you're contagious and fatal to the touch. Well, I hear that you're contagious mm, and fatal to the touch. Agora fica quieto aí. But if you promise not to infect me, baby, I ain't gonna bother you too much. Awesome. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Serge. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It was it was really amazing to to hear all the points that you mentioned. I think that we, we all can relate to which points are very important. Right. Thank and you thank you also for indeed. the song. And thank you for letting me speak. Okay. Thank you. So we can move now to the next speaker, who is Mauricio De Luna. Uh, he's uh, from Brazil. He's a priest of Umbanda. He is uh, a personal power therapist, and uh, he was forming NLP and uh, deep trance technique and systemic and neurosystemic constellations. Uh, since he doesn't speak uh, English, there will be like a translation from uh, Andrea Molinari. So I think Mauricio, uh, you can uh, sí. speak and Andrea will, uh, will, uh, will translate sí. you. Thank you. Okay. Oi, Mauricio. Posso começar então? Pode, com certeza. Bem-vindo, Pedrinho de Souza. É um prazer. Olá, boa tarde. Está com você. Um Obrigado. prazer enorme estar aqui com vocês. It's a very, very good pleasure to stay with you today. Nessa jornada tão poderosa. In this very power day that is today. É... Espero poder contribuir com tudo que está acontecendo neste momento é... na nossa vida. I think I can put my energy in what is happening right now in our lives. É... Eu vejo duas coisas importantes a serem colocadas. Uma é que é um momento de grande oportunidade na nossa vida. I have two things to share with you. One is that this is a very big opportunity that we have right now in our lives. Mas também um momento é, muito difícil para nós como homens. But as well a very difficult moment for us as humans. Eu creio que a maioria de nós, como homens, foi treinado para produzir. Because the majority of us it was made for produce, producing. E não não está sendo nada fácil produzir and, neste and momento. It's not very easy to produce in this moment. Então, o que nos leva a olhar para dentro de nós? And so, what makes us go inside of us? E essa é a grande oportunidade, olhar para dentro de nós. E there is this very big op uh, opportunity to look inside of us. E é, é, é descobrir a nossa capacidade de sentir. To discover our capacity to say no. É a capacidade de sentir como homem. Ah, to feel as humans, not to say no, to feel as humans. A capacidade a capacidade de amar como homem. And to love as humans. É, porque nós como homens talvez é, é, amemos de uma outra forma. Because us as humans, we sometimes we love in another way. 
e, e é importante a gente ter, uh, se dar a oportunidade de, de sentir como homem. And it's very important that we, as, as human, we give us the opportunity to feel as humans. É, de descobrir o amor como homem. To discover the love as humans. É, descobrir a nossa sensibilidade como homem. Discover our sensitivity as humans. E poder contribuir é, sensivelmente como homem para o desenvolvimento humano. And we as humans can put our energy in, in the uh, evolving of the human. É, nós temos tantos líderes é, homens nesse mundo. We have a lot of uh, ma male leaders in this world right now. Que eu creio que nesse momento estão tendo que descobrir é, seus sentimentos, suas emoções e usar isso de uma forma saudável. It would be good that they, they could uh, feel as well and discover the feelings as well. It would be very good. É, e eu creio que alguns estão é, se esforçando bastante para isso. Some leaders are uh, pu uh, they are uh, putting their energy in uh, Study all this. Study how to do this. And to e outros more. continuam é, se perdendo na sua própria ignorância. And others lose themselves in their own ignorance. E nós temos uma, uh, muitas mulheres é, neste momento liderando é, nações. And there are a lot of women right now that are leaders of nations. E, e, e fazendo um bom papel, um bom trabalho. And they are doing good. They are doing a good work. E como homem, eu creio é, que é importante ter a humildade de aprender uma nova forma, um novo jeito para uma nova vida. E, as men, I think it's very important that we find another way to live our lives. É, nos últimos é, tempos, nós temos visto tanta violência, tanta é, é, dor e tanto sofrimento. In the last e times muitas we have vezes... Seen, we have, in last time we have seen so much suffering, you know, so much uh, sadness. É, pela falta de respeito à diversidade. Because uh, there was no respect for the adversity. E, e muitas vezes é, 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 responsabilizam um, um sistema como o patriarcal por toda essa doença. And sometimes you responsabilize the, the patriarchal system for this uh, illness. E eu, 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 eu como homem, eu, 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 eu digo que nós como homens também sofremos a pressão desse sistema. I say that we as men we also suffer the pressure of the system. E nos exige um comportamento e uma postura é, que não é mais é, possível é, existir. Okay, we can, we have to put up a position that is no more possible to live like this. Então eu quero realmente ser livre é, para poder conduzir esta vida através de uma qualidade amorosa saudável para mim, para meus filhos, para minha esposa e para todos. So I want to be free to live my life in this very loving way with all my dears, my wife, my sons, my daughters and to live in peace. É, e fazer yes. isso do meu jeito, é, 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 produzindo e, e trabalhando para que homens tenham espaço para existir com todo o seu amor. And I would uh, put my effort so that uh, 
can, all the men will be respected at, and can uh, share all their values. The man also has to be respected. É, para que homens não sejam mais responsáveis por tanta dor e sofrimento é, pelo desrespeito à diversidade. And so that a man wouldn't be so uh, that wouldn't have this responsibility uh, about all this suffering that they are causing. Então eu desejo que todos nós como homens é, 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 permitirmos a, 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 a oportunidade de perceber que os maiores preconceitos estão em nós como indivíduo. So we, we have to permit ourselves to believe that the biggest concepts are inside of us. É, e como e que e, e, nós podemos ser protagonistas dessa mudança em nós. We have we can be star we can be uh, stars of this experience in us. Reconhecendo é, esses conceitos tão é, é, violentos e pesados que nós é, desenvolvemos até esse momento. Recognizing all the violent parts of ourselves that we are, we were develop, developing so far. E que a gente aprenda a importância de olhar para tudo isso em nós com muito amor. And that we could uh, get into ourselves and see all this with a lot of love. É, é, com muita com muito amor com muito respeito a lot of love and a lot of respect e com muita dignidade and dignity porque eu desejo muito que o meu filho é, contribua com esse mundo com todo o seu amor because i really want that my son would contribute to this world with all his love com tu, com toda a sua sensibilidade with all his sensitivity e com todo o seu afeto. And all his, uh, loving, loving. Yeah. E eu vou trabalhar muito para que ele possa fazer isto neste mundo. Tornando muitas vidas gratificantes. So that Grandiosas many other people, e felizes. So that many other lives would be happy, great and very colorful and happy. Okay. Thank you, Mauricio. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, okay. Mauricio. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muitas bênçãos. Muito axé para todos. Thank you. Thank you all and a lot of axé for everyone. Obrigado. Onde que você está? Onde que você está agora? Está no Brasil? Estou no Brasil. Estou em São Paulo. Ah, está em São Paulo. Que bom. Sim. Então, tivemos a oportunidade de falar com você. Você está muito longe. <laughs> Que massa sim, que você sim, muito obrigado. Aqui, Eu espero poder gente, encontrar velho. vocês pessoalmente logo. Ah, com certeza. Na Itália, na Espanha, logo. Sim, já sinto a conexão. Que bom. Axé. Obrigado, mano. Okay. A gente se Axé. vê. Obrigado. Axé. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Ok, so we, we, we go now to, to our last speaker. So, Dr. Andrea Moinari, psychotherapist of biotransenergetics. So, please. You can go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm feeling the soul. And uh, I really have to say that I, I'm very, I'm feeling it a lot, very much, because I feel all your love and I feel you all. And uh, it was a great opportunity to meet you all in Mandali uh, last year and uh, to get to know you a little more and to feel this energy that there is when we meet each other and we are in contact with each other. And uh, one, the, one of the main things that I move, that moves me right now is to get in touch with the people because, uh, you know, the, the moment that you are with a person can, could be the last moment with this person, okay? And so uh, a lot of... Uh, People of you mentioned, you know, the, the, the theme of, of death. And uh, I really like this, this quote from, from Castaneda and Don Juan when Don Juan says uh, that the, um, the hunter, he lives as 
uh, every action is like his final battle. Uh, and so knowing that there is no other similar thing that you do, <laughs> that you will do, that thing that you are doing, you have to do it 100%. And so the, the moment that you spend with a, pe with a person is a moment that you have to be very 100% there and showing your love, as all my dear brothers said behind me, Serge and Stuart, with, that I really love you and I really hope to, to hug you again. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, to be here, you know, and uh, I really want to say how much I love you and how much it's so important that we share this, this love uh, through this media as well, uh, because uh, we need a lot of energy right now. And this is a very tough moment for us. And uh, uh, I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but in 2017, I was in a, in a Santo Daime work in, of ayahuasca and some, something arrived in my ear and it was like 2020. Twenty, like two thousand twenty. Like what? What would what? What happens in two thousand twenty? You know, so that this happened like two times in a in a separate in two separate months, in two separate works, and so I started to you know to to allow this this message to come, and I I really was aware if it was just my mind or it was something that actually arrived, you know. But I start I started to to trust this, and um. And yeah, so <laughs> uh, I went to this rainbow gathering in, in, um, in 2017. There was a European rainbow gathering. Uh, it was like 4,000. There was a hop in the mountains, five hours to get up to the mountain. There was a 4,000 circle of rainbow brothers and sisters, you know, on the full moon. 4,000, a circle of 4,000, a big fire. And uh, I was under like a, a flying teepee there and was playing with all the brothers and sisters. You know, we, we took uh, uh, just a, a little mushroom, just one little mushroom, everyone, you know, and uh, a little peganum before so that the epic can little grow. So we were kind of this force of this mushroom and we started to play all the medicine songs. And, you know, there was this behind us, there was this circle of 4,000 people. Okay. So I, I just went off the, 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 the stand and I went into the circle and there were all the drums and there was this big fire and and uh, that was a message that arrived to me that I had to say this message to a lot of people before, uh, before 2020. I had to say uh, that to much people I could that we had to uh, focus on ourselves and work over ourselves, working over things uh, that we have time for work to do it right now because after 2020, maybe it wouldn't be so possible to work over these things, you know, some things to solve. So I went into the, in the, in the middle of the circle and uh, I don't know how, like there was a slight second of, of silence, you know, and I said, focus. You know, and the rainbow, you say, focus, and all the people make, put attention on you, okay? And it was a very strong, and focus is like something that you have to use properly, you know? It's not easy because, okay, so I said, okay, in 2000, I mean, uh, we have, uh, this is a, uh, the rainbow right now is a big opportunity for us to trust the thing that we are more, uh, that what we, we think we are, that the, the, the world is bigger than we think, and then there is another perspective, another emerging uh, thing that is growing, and Mother Earth is, is coming into a deep transforma transformation <clears throat> of death, rebirth, you know, and uh, uh, we need to be very aware, uh, and uh, I think it all depends over our thoughts and where we put attention in our thoughts and our disposal to, to live in a, in a state of consciousness, of trust, of health, of that we are one and that there is no, we are protected and we have our guides with us, we have the masters with us. I mean, we have our inner mastery, you know, to, to, to trust, to love and 
if we live loving every instant and as Serge said to to make sacred every uh, moment you know and put the sacred into the days yeah, and during the lifetime then you know everything got better and you just have to relax you know and all the tests are come and went off my last year was very strong I don't know you but uh, Right now, I feel very, you know, hopeful, and I have a lot of, of faith that this is going to go good, you know, and that uh, a new humanity will rise, and we are now starting to see how this will, will uh, structure, get structured. Maybe in little communities, I think, you know, much, much little communities, and all the spiritual houses, and, uh, and, uh, and psychologicals as well, you know, getting in touch with the science and spirituality. So it's a, it's a new, and new energies and new things that you can use of your brain. And so we are much more uh, expanded. We are much more, uh, uh, we, can, we can trust more, we can feel more. So yes, I guess my time is up. So yes. I thank you very much. Uh, everyone from all around the world here, it's been a, I'm, for me it's a pleasure to be part of the team of Pierluigi Lattuada and the School of in Integral Transpersonal. And I invite you to, as well to the second part of this uh, Feeding the Soul, which you know you can have the link, will be put the link on this chat, and there will be a, a body work, you know, the, the dream body work, and there will be uh, DJ running with the ecstatic dance, a uh, very international DJ from ecstatic dance that we have, our beloved friend Fabio. And as well, uh, at the end, uh, there is a medicine chance. And so you can come and, you know, there are a lot of very, very good musicians for you. Thank you, play. Andrea. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, finished uh, the, the round table of the male wisdom. Thank you for, to all the speakers for their precious contribution. Everyone contributed in a very meaningful way and a unique way, I would say. And it was an honor for me to be a moderator of this table. And I want to thank all, also all the participants around the world. And now I will uh, briefly give the words to uh, Dr. Pierluigi Latuada the founder of uh, Integral Transpersonal Institute in Milan, and he will give you also the instruction for the second part of the, of the events on, uh, on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you to all. It was very, very touching to be with all of you. I know that we have uh, finished our time, so I don't want to bother you anymore. I just if I have time, uh, Jim, I just would like to say how does start this idea to ask the people what was the most important in your life for a change of consciousness. When I, I thought about this, I said I I would I want to share with you four recipe as as my friend Sergio said. The first was love. Okay, love, but everybody wants love, but how? And I mean love with your soulmate. Okay, but maybe find a soulmate is is matter of, of like, of karma or something. Maybe, but maybe. So I start to, uh, to thinking and I, I had the insight, but I, in my life, I always follow a voice inside. Maybe this following a voice inside is something that can help to go in direction of love. Okay, but listen to the inner voice. How do you can listen to the inner voice when there are so many voices? The intent, the third part of the recipe is the intent to be, don't do anything else than feel your inner voice against everything, against any, any uh, reasonable, uh, reason and but okay but to do this expand your consciousness we can do this just with the, the rational mind you have to expand your consciousness and, and get uh, 
the what I call the integral thinking, what I call something that comes from the archetypes of the transpersonal self. And then you can find the ally, the ally to stay with the intent following your inner voice and uh, walk the path of love, having uh, an angel beside you. This is my, uh, my greeting for all of us, for all of you. And uh, okay, I only want to invite you to go for a celebration, for, uh, for the celebration, dancing uh, and uh, practicing uh, in our uh, uh, Zoom link, I, I sent to you the, the, the Zoom on chat. If you want, you can go there. And thanks to all, thanks to Jim, thanks to all my friends. If you want to come to order, you can. I finish. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Pier Luigi. Uh, thank you, Francesco, and, and uh, others on the panels uh, that have spoken. Uh, it's amazing we've gotten through so many people in only two hours <laughs> and I wish you all the best for the rest of your program. Uh, that concludes our, our time for the day. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be focusing on the World Unity Week. We've got Ben Bowler who's been one of the co-founders of World Unity Week and a whole panel of people uh, who uh, are actively engaged in the rollout of everything that's going to happen around for this next uh, seven days as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. And we really contemplate what goes into world unity. As Pierre Luigi just said, you know, love, it's easy to say, it's very hard to do. What does it really mean? And how do you change your consciousness so that you can feel it? and express it. Well, similarly around unity, it's easy to say, uh, but the world is being rent asunder with disunity. So how do we change consciousness to unify uh, our species uh, in a natural, harmonious, abundant, uh, and sustainable way? So that'll be tomorrow, uh, same time, same station. It's on Zoom between five o'clock and seven o'clock Central European time. We'll see you then. Thank you, everyone.